Welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network, coming to you from the TeacherCast studios since 2011. Join us each week as we bring you the latest educational news, ed tech updates, and hottest interviews with today's most influential leaders in education. And now, for your host, Jeff Bradbury. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. This is the first podcast back from a brand new year. I hope you guys are having a great time. My guest today is not only an author, a podcaster, but I'm excited today to be sharing a brand new conference that's going to be coming out next weekend, and it's only going to cost $2. And we're going to learn today why $2, how $2, and more importantly, we've got so much to talk about here from his podcast, his book, but I am so excited to have my good friend Dan Jackson on. Hope you have a chance to listen to the interview all through the end. Of course, there's a lot of great things happening on TeacherCast as we have coming up. We've got the conference coming up. We've got FETC in front of us. We've got ISTE coming up. Guys, don't forget to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and of course, share TeacherCast with your friends. We are going into our 12th year of podcasting, and I'm so thankful that you guys have decided to make TeacherCast your home for professional development. My guest today is an author, a podcaster, and he is the host of an amazing conference coming up on the first. I'm scrolling up. I'm scrolling up. Let me try that one more time. Take two. My guest today is an author, a podcaster, and on the 16th to the 20th of January, he is hosting the inaugural online effective teaching conference, something that I hope you guys have a chance to check out. And by the way, I'll be presenting at. I want to bring on today, Mr. Dan Jackson. Dan, how are you today? Welcome to TeacherCast. Thanks, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm in a great mood, actually. I've spent my morning out walking around the garden planting trees, so <laughs> it's been lovely. It has been lovely. I, I keep forgetting every time I talk, we're sitting here in, in, in what is getting to be chilly Connecticut, but uh, it's the summertime for you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm just outside of Sydney in Australia, so it's... 30 degrees outside at the moment and well that's celsius so celsius. Well, i don't know what that is fahrenheit about 85 Seven, or something 90. Yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhere there yeah <laughs> um so tell us a little bit about yourself you, you got your book we're, we'll talk a little bit about you got your podcast we'll talk a little bit about um how'd you get started with all this yeah look i started teaching back in 2006 and to be honest teaching was the last thing i ever wanted to do <laughs> both my parents were teachers as i grew up and I had, you know, first row seats to seeing the workload that came with teaching. My parents were quite often working up late and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I, I didn't want to be one, but in 2006, I actually needed some money. I was fairly young at the time uh, and casual teaching in Australia paid uh, 400 Australian dollars a day uh, for casual teaching here. And so I went at the time, that's great money for me. And so I signed up for a teaching degree because I just had to be enrolled to be able to teach at a private school casually. Uh, and it just went from there. I actually got given a permanent role straight away by a private school and it just kind of snowballed. I really, uh, something that I thought I never wanted to do turned into something that I was actually very passionate about <laughs> by the end of my first year and just seeing, you know, when you're teaching kids and you're working with students and seeing them grow and mature and, you know, it just, you can't help but fall in love with that as a job. And I, I loved it. I've, I've been doing it ever since. That's awesome. Uh, before the break, we had somebody on as a guest who was from the country of Thailand. And I asked him the question, what does the educational system look like? I'm going to ask you the same thing. What does education look like in Australia? How is the world? How is everything post pandemic? Yeah. So in Australia, education, we do, it's kind of like the English system. I guess we got, you know, yeah kindergarten through to year six primary school type bucket and then you have your year seven to year 12 high school bucket there's nothing in between no middle school anything like that uh, some schools kind of create it within themselves if they're a k-12 to school but it's not the way that normal uh, schooling is done across australia here now post pandemic here uh, everyone's back at school things are kind of getting back to normal i mean there's still uh, a teacher shortage here in Australia. Pretty much mm. every teacher I talk to is missing a teacher or two at their school, which then means there's increased because they don't have time off. Like you get your periods off to plan your lessons and that kind of stuff. 
they are all taken up with extras now so you could go and cover someone else's lesson because the teachers aren't there and we have a lack of casuals as well so uh, you know, we can't even get casuals into schools at the moment because there's just not enough of them uh, and that's partly i think to do with the generation like teaching there's quite a larger older population in teaching at the moment and i think a lot of those people kind of took the opportunity during covid to kind of go i'm going to retire mm -hmm. see you later uh, and that's kind of led to this shortage post covid and, and one of the things i'm noticing here about this influx of new staff members is that the need for professional development is greater now probably more than it's ever been and you've been trying to figure out how to support teachers globally learn and and get connected with each other i'm excited that i'm going to be one of the presenters at your inaugural online effective teaching conference which is going to be happening on the 16th to the 20th of january of this year how did this all come about and and who's presenting this year yeah look i have wanted to do a conference like this since i started kind of doing stuff on the side while i was teaching and then uh, went into full-time kind of uh, education consulting and uh, going and coaching teachers and that kind of stuff. And so I actually first got the idea from a guy called uh, Jared Robinson. He's mm -hmm. called the PE geek. He's quite well known internationally. He does a international PE well used to at least do a PE conference once a, for a whole week. And it was early January and it just, yeah, he, he did it for free. I don't know how he could afford to do it for free, <laughs> but he, he could. Uh, and so he had all these people show up and I loved it. I got to present for him once after I attended it a couple of times and really enjoyed it. I uh, enjoyed meeting people, learning new stuff and all that kind of stuff. And so I've always wanted to be able to run a super cheap online conference that goes for roughly a week where I can get some great presenters in and they can all come and you know give really good content for teachers, for essentially nothing. I mean, the conference, I'm selling it for $2, uh, you know, so anyone who wants to come for two bucks, you get a whole week worth of PD. Uh, and that's three to four sessions a day for five days. And it's, yeah, I think it's going to be amazing. I think yeah, not only Jeff, are you coming and presenting, which I think is fantastic. I'm looking forward to your session, <laughs> but just across the board, like I remember when I first came up with the idea, I'm like, I'm going to just send out a couple of emails to a few people and see what happens basically. And if they don't say that they can do it, then I just won't run the conference. And I was sending emails to people like, you know, Jay McTee and John Hattie, uh, people who are very well known, uh, who are quite established in their careers towards the end of them for some of them even. And both of them replied and were like, yeah, I'd love to, because like, I'm asking them to do it for free, right? Because it's a $2 conference. I can't afford to pay them their normal kind of $10,000 for a day type fee. His <laughs> education consultants can have. And so as soon as that came in, I was like, that's it. I've got, I now have to send out lots of emails to all the people <laughs> who I want to come. Uh, and I've got to you know, set up the sales page and all that kind of stuff. And so it kind of rolled from there. But I've just been blown away, to be honest. Like I was planning to have you know, three sessions a day for the five days. And because the number of people who got back to me and said, yes, I've actually added a couple of extra sessions to include a few extra people who I didn't want to say no to. <laughs> Because they they're just there's it's an amazing group of educators and they're you know international educators. We've got people from Australia, people from the US, uh, and I think I might even have a few people from other countries as well who are all coming and just sharing their wealth of knowledge. Some of them are professors, some of them are classroom practitioners, uh, some of them are just very experienced kind of coaches now because uh, they, they were classroom practitioners and have moved into that coaching kind of space like I have. And I think there's just, it's just going to be amazing. I, I'm looking forward to it as a teacher just to come and sit, like I'm going to be at every single session because I'm going to kind of introduce everyone and all that kind of stuff. But I am looking forward to just sitting down and learning from everyone who's there because I, I don't look at a session and go, I don't want to listen to that. Like every session I get excited about. The website is teacherspd.net forward slash conference. And Dan, I got to say this to you. I love the fact that you have that domain. That is an amazing domain to have teacherspd.net. And, and again, just to kind of go over some of the names, and obviously we can't name everybody here. The list is long and very distinguished. But you mentioned Jay McTee, John Hattie, Casey Bell, Holly Clark, Steph Howell, Tara Ruckman, uh, Jen Giffen. Let's see, myself, Erica Terry, Alice Kim, Susie Boss, 
lots and lots and lots of great practitioners that no matter if you're a teacher, administrator, instructional coach, or any form of, of educator, this is a great for you. And I got to ask, because you, you, where did the $2 come from? <laughs> oh, look, I just needed uh, something that would kind of cover the expenses to, for the actual hosting of it. And I figured the expense wasn't going to be great because it's online. Uh, and so I just went, well, two bucks, you know, it's two dollar conference. It's just, it's easy. It rolls off the tongue. And, you know, I figure five bucks, it's kind of like I may as well make it 10 bucks if it's five bucks. But at two bucks, it's really nothing. Uh, but, you know, we have 700 teachers who have already signed up for this. And so that then provides me you know, a kind of just enough to pay for uh, Zoom, which is where we're going to be uh, hosting it and it's going to be a Zoom event. So it's, I didn't even realize that there was a thing called Zoom events. It's just, uh, it's been great to then roll into the conversations with people about even all the different tech stuff. Did you know you can do virtual events using avatars walking around actual like places? That's crazy. That's cool. <laughs> I, I have a story to confess to you here. Um, recently, I was in a coaches group meeting and we were trying to figure out how to start up like a monthly kind of coaches thing. And and this conference actually came up in the conversation. And the reason is because we were trying to figure out, well, how long do you have the meetings? Do we have them for an hour? Do we have them for a half an hour? And someone's like, I know this $2 conference is kind of interesting because as you mentioned, it's not five bucks. It's not yeah. free. And so I think we decided to have the meeting something like 68 minutes or no, it was like 38 minutes or something like that. And it was just the same concept of it doesn't have to be 60 minutes. It doesn't have to be 30. But if we said at, I don't remember the time, 36 minutes, we are done. At least then that's something interesting and that kind of gets people going to it. So you, you are already having an influence on what's happening in education, Dan. That's kind of a cool story. I thought I wanted to tell you. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. That's cool. It's cool. When you, you had mentioned that you got more than 700 people signed up already and please head on over again, teacherspd.net forward slash conference to register. Of course, we're going to have all of the links and stuff in our show notes here. Um, we've got so many great speakers. We have so many great sessions. What do you hope your, I'll say audience, but what do you hope your, your, your audience gets out of this conference, whether they go to one session or a dozen sessions? Look, I think there's a lot that you get out of conferences generally, like even without the sessions when you show up and, you know, I'm hoping to build in some networking time and all that kind of stuff to happen as well so that people can actually meet other teachers and have the conversations that you would have at a conference. I love networking. I think it's fantastic. But then to sit down at the feet of people who have been, you know, teaching for a long time and who are super uh, knowledgeable in their specific areas, like let's, Take John Lama, for example, who's, you know, he founded the Buck Institute and is the author of, you know, a half a dozen or more books about project-based learning. And to be able to sit down and learn from him, you know, how to set up and start a project-based learning unit, uh, you know, I think that's fantastic. And then to go from someone like that to someone like Brendan Lee, who is a deputy principal, classroom-based, full-time working, you know, at his school, but he's going to be talking about direct instruction, and the importance of direct instruction for learning as well. And it's you know, a lot of people would contrast those two and say, well, project-based learning doesn't fit with direct instruction. But when you actually go through and read you know, the books that John Lama's mm -hmm. written, you know, direct instruction is part of what happens within project-based learning, but it happens in a different way, essentially. And so you know, to have someone like Brennan come in and talk about direct instruction, he does a lot of work uh, around direct instruction. He runs a little networking meeting uh, that he's involved in and they constantly are focusing on you know, evidence-based practices that are coming out of you know, professors and universities and stuff that look at how to do direct instruction really well, what processes work really well. And it's a lot of you know, formative assessment built into that kind of a process. And so I'm looking forward to that. You know, I have a friend, Kelly Bell, who's going to come and present on formative assessment. I just, because yeah, I just mentioned formative assessment. I'm like, no, oh, there's a session on that as well. Uh, and she's going to talk about how amazing you know, formative assessment is and how impactful that can actually be for us as teachers and for them, for our students. And she's been a classroom practitioner for a long time. Uh, she's also doing some kind of some coaching as well. And she's just, you know, these are amazing educators who, you know, I've met, honestly, I've met most of them through the podcast because I'm sure you're aware, Jeff, that once you have a podcast and you send someone an email and go, hey, would you like to be a guest on my podcast? Almost everyone says yes. Yes. And it's, it's just so good. It's such an amazing way to network with awesome educators. 
And so most of these people I've interviewed once already, and now I'm like, great, now you're going to come back and run a whole session and help 700 plus. You know, I'm hoping there'll be a lot more that will sign up between now and the 16th of January. And that's in the Sydney time. So it's actually the 15th of January that it starts in the US uh, and we'll run to the 19th in the US. But uh, yeah, I just think all these amazing people who give up their time for free to share their knowledge and to help other teachers to become more effective. And I think that's, that's the end goal is to become more effective, not to become you know, better at getting stuff done, but actually become better practitioners, which is what effectiveness is all about. It's about actually doing more of the right things. And that you know, part of my book is all about reducing your workload and being able to be effective as you choose the things that you actually focus on to do and cutting out the things that actually don't, produce much of an impact for you or for your students. And so, you know, doing that in the classroom as well with the strategies that we choose to implement and how we go about the process of implementing that. And you become way more effective when you sit down and you learn from other people who have been there and done it. And you go, that sounds fantastic. I'm going to learn from that. And then I'm going to implement what I've learned. And that is the way that you save a lot of time because you don't have to go and do the research. You have to do the trial and error throughout the whole process. You know, we have people who are coming in, you know, I've, Eleni Karitsis, for example, who's going to be the first session at the conference. Her school has run so many awards in Australia and she's won awards and it's, she's going to come and just talk about what her school does, like what this actual teaching and learning looks like that has won them all these awards and how to implement it. And you know, she's the deputy principal of that school and she's just to, to sit there and go, great, you're going to show me how to do this, right? That's, that's years of work that's happened at that school that then just gets given to you and you're like, all right, I'm going, to, I'm going to try this and I now have someone who I can connect with and ask questions with and actually do that whole bouncing uh, and learning information from in the, as it happens in your networking, you're chatting with people. The conference, again, is called the Inaugural Online Effective Teaching Conference. You can head on over to Teacher teacherspd.net forward slash conference. I got to say my favorite session out of the entire thing happens to be at six o'clock on Tuesday, the 17th. It's called three edu productivity systems for the way too busy instructional coach. That's right. We're going to be sitting here going through three of my quick tips for making sure that your instructional coaching programs are going right. I'll tell you one thing you're going to walk away with some tips, some tricks, and definitely some templates. So hope you guys have a chance to check this out. We're going to be promoting it on our social media feeds. And guys, it is only to American dollars. So if you have a a, a coaching department, talk to your district, have them spend 10 bucks. The entire coaching department can come and we would love to see you there. Now, Dan, you had mentioned the word effective. I know you know something about being effective. I also know you know something or two about effective teaching I believe you're host. You're the host of the Effective Teaching Podcast, aren't you? I am. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. How'd you get started? Uh, I got started honestly. I was at a Google Innovator Day Ooh. at Google in Sydney, Ooh. and they kind of threw out a challenge of what you should be doing, like how you're going to impact people. And I had this idea in my head about starting a podcast already, and so I harassed Chris. <laughs> I went, <laughs> how do I? start up a podcast. It's like, oh, I do this, this. So I actually recorded, the very first episode is recorded inside Google. I just went and found a quiet space and recorded it. And I think the first one's about goal setting. I uh, uh-huh. figured that's a good place to start. And it started off essentially looking at strategies that help to create lifelong learners uh, because I wanted to look at teaching as a way to actually help students for life, not just about helping them for exams. Uh, since kind of adapted a bit and grown as things do over the years to now focusing more broadly on effective teaching and that includes you know reducing your workload so that you're focusing on the things that matter the most it includes effective strategies in your classroom that actually produce learning in your students or that help your students to engage in the learning process so that they actually because learning is something students do and you know we teach but they're the ones that actually do the learning and so it's focusing a lot on you know the kinds of things that actually are impactful have a have a good impact in your classroom and that are effective. You're not, you're getting things done at a, at a rate that's more productive than your normal other strategies that you might use. Well, I got to tell you, I am certainly impressed with the fact that a Google innovator project is now on season four and more than 130 episodes. What is your secret for longevity here? How do you keep it going? Uh, look, it, I think 
having having the joy of like I do a lot of episodes myself, but also interview a lot. Mm-hmm. And so it's not just a, like I don't have to find someone to interview in order to record a, a session, but also I don't have to come up with all the ideas myself in order to record a session. And so I think that's helped a lot, to be honest, with the longevity of it. Uh, the networking that's come out of it has been amazing. Like I've done multiple sessions with a few educators like um, yeah, Trevor McKenzie. I've got three or four episodes with him. I did five episodes, I think, with Casey Bell quite early on uh, around dynamic teaching or dynamic learning. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that was those kinds of things that happen. I just They're amazing to just be able to connect in with amazing educators and learn from them and then uh, grow with them with them, but also from them. Uh, that's really been a great driver. Also receiving the feedback and the comments that you get from people who listen and they're like, Oh, I love this episode. I'm going to go and try this. You know, I've had a few teachers who have sent me emails like that. And then I've gone, Hey, come on the, on the podcast. I'm going to talk to you about how you put this into practice and the impact that it's had. And that's just, yeah, it's just this cycle of networking and uh, just support this, beautiful support that happens through it. I just think it's amazing. Why would I not do it? If I've got the, if I've got a chance, I will be doing it. <laughs> like <laughs> It's it, I, it. Wow. I'm glad that you said that. Cause that is the phrase that I hit more often is why would I not podcast? Why would I not sit here and talk to people? Why would I not share all this knowledge with everybody else? I love that you have that. Um, so check that out. Check that out. Um, we're also going to make sure that we have all the links to his podcast as well. But I got to tell you, what I'm excited about right now, and I'm holding it in my hand, is this amazing book called Work Less, Teach More, How to Be an Effective Teacher and Live a Life You Love. Big, beautiful blue cover. Dan, what is this book about? Uh, The book is all about being an effective teacher. And this, uh, I do have plans to write more, but at the moment I'm swamped with other work. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, this was my COVID project, basically. So when I was no longer able to go into schools and do the consulting that I normally would do and run uh, you know, workshop one day off workshops and stuff like that, that I would normally run. I went, well, I'm going to write a book and my book, you know, I asked teachers at the beginning of the year, what's, what's the biggest problem you have? And I was hoping for them to tell me about, you know, programming or something like that, writing assessments or something. And, you know, they all write back, you know, it's the workload. Everyone's got too much work. And I knew that as soon as I started reading it, I'm like, I should have put in the question, not workload. like. <laughs> but then as I reflected on it through the year, like that was, I surveyed this teachers probably in January or February. And then I didn't start writing this book until maybe August that same mm-hmm. year. And it took me a while. I was just thinking, I'm like, eventually I worked out, I actually do have stuff that I can say that will help teachers reduce their workload because I managed to be a full-time teacher. I was a, a dad and a husband and ran two businesses on the side and I was still loving life. Like I I wasn't feeling drained. I did have time with my kids. You know, I was finished work. I walked in the house pretty much every day at quarter past four and I was done pretty much every day, unless it was like a parent teacher interview night, then I may have been at school a bit longer, but that was how I functioned for quite a long time. And it was all from stuff that I learned through a lot of the business books, you know, the effective uh, stuff that exists in a lot of business books around these days. Uh, And so I've just, pulled all that stuff out that I was implementing myself. And then I just went, you know what, I'm going to share this and write a book about how to do this as a teacher. And so, you know, it starts off with, you know, it's, it's actually about being effective, not about being productive. It's not about doing more. It's actually about doing more of the right things. And so understanding, you know, there's all these rules and concepts, but you know, the 80, 20 rule where actually 20% of what you do produces 80% of your impact and then taking that to then go, well, what identifying those 20% tasks and doing them more. Obviously, there's stuff that you can't avoid that are the 80% tasks that there are definitely admin things you have to do as a teacher. But a lot of things that we do, we actually can question, we can push back on, and some stuff we can actually just not do. Uh, and some stuff is, you know, teachers, like I remember spending ages pining over whether or not this lesson was the best lesson and it taking ages and trying to get it perfect and then, you go and you teach it and you're like, I put so much effort into that planning and the kids hated it. <laughs> you know, it was a perfect lesson, I thought. But And so just working through that idea of you know, being a perfectionist and like you actually don't need, you're better off as a teacher looking long-term and going, I'm going to put together a quick lesson here uh, and then see what happens and actually reflect on the lesson and adjust it from there. And it's there's so many 
things throughout the whole book. Like, but it's a system, it's a process to actually go through and go, this is what I want as a teacher. These are my goals. And then let's actually focus on those with my time. Let's focus on those with the impact that I'm after. So if you actually want specific impacts on your students, then let's focus on those and then let the other things that aren't as important actually fall away. I want to, I want to hit one of the topics that are in here and you know, you talk a lot about the fourth hour and the fact that you can only really focus on things like like four hour chunks. And that's difficult for most teachers. They have a six, seven, eight hour day. They don't stop. They don't take a break. They're in the middle of being an adult, a child, a parent, a coworker, a staff member, an employee. The door opens up, the principal walks in and all they're on constantly. You are, I are, we all are. Why should we be thinking in four hours? What is the secret behind making sure that we're able to take that break, put our time in, and and what is that fourth hour all about? So the four hours is really about deep work. So you can only do deep work for four hours in a day. Uh, whether or not you can do that four hours as one massive chunk, some of us probably can. Uh, some of us will probably struggle to do that. But across the whole day, Generally speaking, your brain can only handle about four hours of deep work. And deep work is defined essentially as work that really stretches your brain that you've got to think hard about uh, and you really need to be focused for. It's the work you can't do you know, when you're in a big staff room and everyone else is around you making noise and interrupting you. Like that's the opposite of deep work. You can't get deep work done. You know, checking your emails doesn't count as deep work. What counts as deep work as a teacher is, you know, when you're actually going through your unit design process and creating a brand new unit, when you're going through a big welfare issue and trying to work out what is the right process that the school should be putting into place for this student, given all these other complexities that are going on. They're the deep work, you know, kind of stretching my brain, give me a headache late at night type stuff. But we can only do that for four hours. And so it's important for us to actually prioritize those four hours and go, you know what, I get four hours of deep work done. And so I would, I, you know, in the book, it talks about blocking out time to actually get those four hours done. And then the times when you want to be kind of available or not so focused, and you're doing your shallow work. So when you're going to check your emails, you might scroll through social media, you might be making your lunch. They're all shallow work tasks that you got to do. You can do them distracted. And so organize them to be in places where you can be distracted, where you might actually have someone interrupt it and book in a meeting with you that so that you can actually sit down and chat about something else that's going on. Maybe you've got a coach at your school who looks after you and wants to come and debrief brief after uh, watching you teach or something like that. And so you allow this scheduling process where you prioritize your four hours of deep work where you're working on, you, know, you might be marking a bunch of assessment tasks, you might be providing students with a bunch of feedback on something that you've they've submitted to you. They're deep work tasks. You have to be focused for those. And so when you're doing those tasks, you go somewhere where you're not going to be distracted. You don't take your phone, all that kind of the stuff you teach your students when they're in your class, right? You say, put your phones away, you know, don't sit with them next to your friends. We want you to be focused. You know, we kind of want a quietish classroom if someone's actually giving some kind of content. Uh, or if they're doing research and they're doing you know, brain processing stuff, and then we'll organize the chats that happen to kind of expand on that. And that's the same thing for us. When we're doing deep work, you need to schedule that and block it out and be focused for that because you can't do it well if you're going to be distracted. Two more topics I wanted to hit. You have something here, which I think is interesting on page 127 for those reading the home book here, the trap of perfectionism. Why is this a trap and why do why do you think teachers feel the need to be perfectionists i think look let's start with the need so teachers feel the need to be perfectionists because they are essentially on show all day every day like when you walk into that classroom you are being judged by your 30 40 students you've got in front of you if you're lucky enough it's 20 but you're being judged by that Possibly you have you know, another teacher coming in to observe you. Uh, when the students then do tests and get results, you're being judged on those results. Or at least we feel like we are. It, we're not necessarily all being judged like that, but we have this pressure that we put on ourselves. And you know, I say by ourselves, I don't necessarily mean that I'm putting it on me, but we as teachers put it on each other. And we sit down and we might look at someone's exam marks and go, well, you know, that teacher isn't very good because they didn't get 90s. You know, uh, all their students got. 80s and 70s but they might miss the fact that none of their kids got 30s or 40s you know? <laughs> uh, yeah and then 
there's this element of judgment. I mean, I'm sure you guys have it in the States. So we've got you know, national, nationwide tests. We have statewide tests that are done. Mm-hmm. And they're used by our social media, by you know, the um, general media, by other parents and stuff that, to just put pressure on us as teachers about how well we're doing. And so that forces us into this idea of, you know, of this perf- perfect lesson that we're trying to plan. And we're just constantly trying to refine things. And we spend a lot of time on things that actually don't have a big impact. We, we get really tedious about this kind of thing or we might, you know, when we're giving feedback to students, we'll be writing a massive essay for them to read. And in reality, no student's going to read that unless you kind of sit them down and force them to. And even then, they're not listening. They're just reading it because they got made to. <laughs> so it's important for us to actually realise what bits are most important for us. And so then when you're in the perfectionist trap, you're working really hard to create something that's fantastic and then you implement it. And sometimes that'll be great. Maybe it's going to be, it will be a fantastic lesson, but other times it's not going to be, you know, put in all this work and it's going to flop and you're going to have to go back to the drawing board. And so this idea of actually creating, you know, good enough basically type lessons. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like I don't want you to create, you know, terrible good enough lessons, but create a lesson that's good enough to actually help the students to learn what they've got to do, to learn the content, to apply the content, learn the skills they've got to learn, and then reflect and adjust. I mean, honestly, as teachers, we adjust so much on the fly anyway. It's one of those great skills. If you go and watch an experienced teacher teach, can compare that to a new out, a, you know, a fresh teacher. The fresh teacher has this you know, schedule. They've timed everything to the minute, and that's what they're trying to stick to, whereas the experienced teacher comes in with an idea and they know it's going to move all over the place throughout the whole right. lesson. But they come prepared for what they want to get through, but they also have that they know that things are going to change and adapt. And the experienced teachers are changing and they're adapting on the spot multiple times. And so as we help the younger student teachers, what we want to be doing is actually getting them away from this perfect lesson that they're trying to prepare and actually go, you know what? Let's create something that's good enough and reflect because the reflection is what's important. You create a great uh, semi-good lesson. It might go fantastic. Why? What happened? What can you replicate for your next lesson? How can we keep that lesson for next year? Because we can generally as teachers keep very similar lessons year to year depending on how much change happens to you if you right. move from year five to year eight then sorry that's you got to write again <laughs> but you can give that to someone else and go look this lesson worked amazingly for me give that a go and they will love you for it and that's that's stuff that we need to work on as teachers is just go we don't need to be perfect you know we feel this pressure of judgment but we can also help others to not feel that by just going you know it's not about everyone getting a perfect lesson. It's about your lesson actually helping students learn. And we always, we all fail. I've had some terrible lessons as a teacher <laughs> where kids have thrown over chairs and stuff. Like I, you, you get the full range throughout your career. And I think as we go, if we just keep reflecting on that good enough and then improving and then reflecting and improving, eventually you're kind of good enough suddenly becomes that amazing lesson without you having to have spent all that time to put together something that may actually not go so well. Well, I, I find it interesting that you s- wrote really, really beautifully about not being a perfectionist, but then like on the next page or two, you talk about outsourcing. So you have more time to do things. Um, I don't know if that was intentional, but talk to us a little bit about outsourcing. Cause I mean, one of the things that you mentioned there is have other people do your laundry. Um <laughs> Give us, give us your thoughts on outsourcing and, and how, why, um, where, and, yeah, and look, think, who's doing your laundry these days? Yeah, he's doing my laundry. My nine-year-old son does my laundry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I can handle that now. All right, I'm with you outsourcing. now. Like, we're not talking about, you know, you have to hire an administrative, t- administrative assistant. I mean, if your school has the money and they can, then do. I actually think that there's a chapter at the end that talks about school system kind of set up, and I... I am a big believer that yeah, each faculty at a school should have an administrative assistant who does the admin for you. Yeah, you want to you mark the kids assessment task and then give it to an admin who then enters it into all the data processes that, that needs to be entered into and half writes your comments for you because your comments most of the time are actually based on outcomes or based on um, uh, standards. That's what they're called in America, right? Standards. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you write your comment, half of it's based on that and then the other bit's about behavior. So you just then write bits about behavior as the teacher, you know, the personal bits, the, the admin can do that. The admin 
can book in your buses for excursions. Your admin can fill in your WHS risk assessments. They can fill in all your variations to routines. They, like, there's so much that they can do, but that's generally unrealistic for most schools. I mean, it is if they actually think about it and their finances and to go, actually, this will save us money to do that. But that's a whole other issue That's because it's a <laughs> system issue. But on the personal level, when we look at things, we need to think about the things that we love, that we're really good at and that we have to do. Like you think about, we are teachers who are you know, university qualified. All of us probably have debts of some kind that we've got to pay off right? because of our education. And so when I'm paying a teacher, I should be paying them more than what it costs for an admin or more than it costs for someone else like that. And that's why an admin assistant actually does make sense for schools. But as a teacher, I can outsource anything that doesn't require my level of skill. And that can be stuff at home. That can be stuff at school. And so if you're looking at something that's not a formal assessment task, so it's not going to count for things long-term, then why are you necessarily doing all the feedback and marking of that yourself at home? You could easily bring that into your classroom and actually make it a lesson for your students to learn how to give each other feedback and go through that process with them. And that saves you time. It might take up you know, 20 minutes of your lesson, but that 20 minutes of your lesson actually is going to save you three hours at home. And so we need to just look at those kinds of things throughout. You know, I have lots of times used students to do stuff for me as a teacher and not stuff that's personal information. I'm not risking you know, major things on students, but they do have skills that are kind of administrative or anything like that that you could possibly actually go, do you know what? Can you help me do this? You know, marking the role. You, some schools, you're going to mark the role every single lesson. Give it to a kid. Don't waste your time, right? Ask a student, here's, here's the thing. Who's here? Who's not? Mark it off. And then you can double check it later if you're worried that the student who you've chosen is going to lie and say, this person was here, but they weren't really, right? But that's kind of stuff you know anyway as a teacher. Like once you've been teaching a class for three weeks, you kind of go, someone's missing, <laughs> you know? And you, you, can, you can do that. But then even switching that, like you talk about at home, there's so much stuff at home that we can actually, particularly if you have children and children who are a bit older, I'm getting excited that my nine-year-old is now you know, doing my laundry, my five-year-old is doing my dishes. Uh, you know, this is, this is life and I'm training my students up, my kids up for life. But it also means, you know, I'm looking forward to the day when my nine-year-old is you know, just, just strong enough to push the lawnmower out of my heel with the grass so he can mow that or they're big enough to go and like we've got goats on my block and chickens and quails and all kinds of animals when they're big enough to just go you know go and look after those like it actually becomes their job and that's me teaching them responsibility and all this other stuff but it's also me outsourcing and going that's now something i don't have to do you know my nine-year-old can kind of cook like he can make himself breakfast he can uh help with things like dinner he can help shell beans and all that kind of stuff it's reducing my time in that. It's also creating fantastic time for me with my child sometimes. So if we're cooking dinner together, that's, a, that's great. Like you're creating family unit bonding time type stuff while you're doing something. And that's the flip side of, of the outsourcing. If it's something you can't necessarily outsource, if you have family and you've, uh, you know, as a teacher, you go, I don't have time. Like I'm looking at the time with my kids that I really want. Build that time into things that you have to do. Right. So take your kids shopping with you. I know, you know, I often go shopping with both my kids. It can be a hassle, but it's also time that I get with my kids. And it's time where I might, you know, I might spoil them with something every now and then, uh, buy an extra nice piece of fruit or whatever for them to eat during the shopping trip. But this is a way for us to just think purposefully. And that's really a lot of what the book talks about is just being purposeful with how you use your time. Because often what we find is that if we're tired and exhausted when we get home and you crash on the couch and you watch Netflix or whatever for a couple of hours, that's actually two hours that you could have been doing something else. Uh, you know, you could at least be watching it with a child or with a husband or a wife or you know, a partner of some kind. And there's, there's so much that we can actually be more purposeful with. And part of the book's whole process is actually making sure that we holding ourselves accountable to this idea of you know we're being overworked and yeah that we have a lot of mental stress a lot of work but also to look at and go where are the time periods where i'm kind of not doing what i could be doing and then making sure you're more purposeful with that time and you can purposefully book in you know two hours of netflix that's fine (laughs) but it's you being purposeful about that and going this is when i'm going to need that time 
right? And this is when I can, when I can fit it in and when my children will be around to enjoy it with me. And yeah, that, that becomes a much better use of your time than getting home, flopping down and going, oh, I'm exhausted, turning something on, then go, oh no, it's like nearly seven o'clock and I haven't started dinner. But that leads to bad habits. It, le- like it, it makes life harder. And so lots of challenges in the book, but also lots and lots of help in there as well. And one more time, guys, that's why everybody should have a nice set of triplets at home to make sure that they're doing all of this work. I, I think that was the that that was the moral of the story, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Everyone go and have some triplets and then like raise them real quick. <laughs> Dan, I want to say thanks so much for coming on the show today. You know, I'm looking forward to being a part of the conference coming up. Of course, again, you can find out more information about the conference over at teacherspd.net forward slash conference. We're going to make sure we have everything and all the links over here in our show notes today over at the TeacherCast podcast. You can check out everything over at teacherscast.net. Dan, outside of the conference, outside of the book, outside of the podcast, where do you want us to find you? What's your what's your Twitters, your Mastodons, your all that other good stuff that you might have out there? Yeah, all my Instagrams and Twitters and TikToks and stuff are all Dan Jackson uh, TPD. So Dan Jackson TPD for Teachers PD. <laughs> love the love the book, love the podcast, love the conference, and more importantly, love the branding. Love it. everything is all the same, very easy to use. Guys, check out all of his stuff. Learn how to make the most out of your time how to work less, how to teach more. My good friend, Dan Jackson. Dan, thanks so much for coming on the show today. My absolute pleasure, Jeff. Hope you guys had a great holiday. We've got a lot of great stuff coming up, tons and tons of episodes, but we would love to hear from you. This podcast is all about making sure that all of our teachers have a voice. If you'd like to share your stories on TeacherCast, please reach out, head on over to teachercast.net, hit that contact button and fill out our little form. We would love to have you guys on here. And I hope that I see you guys on the 16th of January at 6 p.m. for my session at Dan's amazing conference. And that wraps up this episode of the TeacherCast podcast. On behalf of Dan and everybody here in the TeacherCast educational network. My name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you guys to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. You've been listening to the TeacherCast Educational Network, hosted by Jeff Bradbury. Please reach out to the show with all of your questions on Twitter at TeacherCast or online at www.teachercast.net. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And please take a moment to write a review in the App 